Hello everyone once again, this is Rob and welcome back to Media Awareness and my continuing reviews and overview of The Wheel of Time Season 2. We are on Episode 5 this week. Before I continue, however, a quick reminder the fundraiser is continuing. For those of you unaware, I am a disabled individual and I use a motorized wheelchair slash scooter for my independence on a daily basis, all day, every day. And although many of these significant goals have been met in terms of sustaining my health, well-being, and safety, there are still concerns and many things that need to be addressed, and therefore I still need your help. My insurance will not cover any of this, so I'm reaching out to you, my YouTube community, to help out. There is a spot fund account link below. You can contribute easily there and every contribution is welcome. I'm asking for $10 a person. However, if you can do more than that, that's wonderful and it is greatly appreciated. My scooter is in need of tremendous upkeep and repairs and I really need to get this done as soon as possible. So. Please do your best to do so, and I really want to thank those who have already contributed. Your contributions have made a world of difference in my life. And to those who plan on contributing, thank you in advance. I love you all. You're wonderful people. And thank you again and again and again. So, The Wheel of Time, Episode 5. By far my favorite episode so far in this season. It has been ramping up gradually and it's hitting its stride in this episode. And I want to talk about so many things. I'm going to be bouncing around so forgive me I'm telling you right away. And I'm also going to be giving away a lot. So if you don't want spoilers for the books or the series or the TV Amazon Prime series, do not watch any further. With that out of the way, I want to just jump into one of the plot lines that really I um, enjoyed, and that is Perrin. We we're finally getting some proper character development and, mo and, and um, movement for Perrin. Uh, Perrin has been in this grieving state over his the death of his wife Layla by his own hand which is understandable and we all grieve in our own time and we all handle things on our own level in our own time but this episode is sort of a game changer it would seem like and the reason I say that at least temporarily is um, he ends up in this village um, He's drawn there by a vision of one of his wolf brethren who he feels the need to bury, to give a proper burial to. But upon entering the village, he sees a woman in a cage and he's struck by this. This is something he's never experienced. And he's told by the young gentleman not to bother with her, she'll tear you apart, basically, and, you know, come with me, I'll get you a drink and some a room, and, uh, they sit together, they have drinks, and the, and the guy is cordial to Perrin, but that's, he's cordial and respectful. To Perrin, but Perrin sees him interacting with the white cloaks, who we know are just viciously evil. They're <laughs> they're probably uh, more um, of an immediate danger than the Dark One himself at this point. So Perrin sneaks down there, sets the girl free. And um, 
she asks him why he set her free. And he says, you know, people shouldn't be in cages or something like that. And she respects that and respects him, I suppose, for setting her free and respects him overall um, having the ability to probably sense his connection with the wolf as well given she is an ideal. So they are confronted by the White Cloaks and the gentleman who is helping him is aligned with the White Cloaks and they get totally obliterated by this woman and Perrin and the woman of course is Avienda. In the books um, there is a gentleman that is in, in the cage and Perrin frees him and uh, there's a different storyline that takes place. I'm thinking that they're combining his character with that of Avienda. At least that's what it seems like to me, which I'm perfectly fine with. Um, I love Avienda and uh, this portrayal of her is just amazing and so accurate in my opinion. Uh, so, they escape after basically obliterating these white cloaks. And the gentleman who was nice to him and who actually gave the Ayo, the Ayo woman of the end of water um, um, in the evening uh, with Perrin there, uh, Perrin urges her to spare him. And she does. And she respects Perrin for setting her free. She says, my water is your water, which is indicative of the eye of the ideal. And it's an oath, basically, that they swear um, as sort of an allegiance, if you will. So there is that storyline, which I can't wait to see how that unfolds in this particular iteration of The Wheel of Time, having uh, a great love for Avienda as, as a character. And now Perrin as well, as they have some interesting banter that occurs after they're free, um, after she's free, rather. And it's really, uh, it's amusing, but it's very much in her character, in my opinion. So I do love that a lot. So from there, I want to move on to one of my other favorite characters, Leandrin. <laughs> and I don't know what it is about women who are evil and charismatic. It's just so attractive. <laughs> and knowing what I know about Leandrin and knowing how evil she really is and that's revealed in this episode to some degree with her being part of the secretive and all often speculated black Aja which is of course sworn to the big dark one and isn't really supposed to exist within the context of the Aes Sedai yet it does and uh, Leandrin has abducted um, Nynaeve, Egwene, and uh, Elaine, um, and taking them to the Shanshang. Um, and she, after kind of leaving them there, she departs shortly thereafter. Uh, Nynaeve, Egwene, and Elaine Try to make a run for it, but Egwene is held back and is not able to uh, follow Chase, follow, um, follow the escape. She is held back. And the Shan Chang women are basically, whereas the Aes Sedai are raised to use the one power and 
learn how to channel and learn how to control it early on um, once they're accepted at the White Tower. The Shanshang are used in a uh, their channeling of the One Power is almost a, a slave uh, uh, master dynamic, basically, where they're ordered to use the power and they use it. And they are extremely powerful. And like I said, they subdue uh, Egwene and Nynaeve and Elaine and um, escape to the city. And they are um, not so quickly uh, stopped by a nice advised warder. Um, and that storyline, I, I know where it's leading, so, um, it's kind of interesting to see that being played out, but Ishmael is just at the top of his game in this episode, and he has this incredible, uh, back and forth banter with, with Lanfear, um, a.k.a. Selene from previous episodes. Uh, Lanfear, of course, is one of the Forsaken, uh, and she is uh, able to invade dreams and manipulate dreams in her dreams and harm you in her inner dreams if she wants to. So... She's waiting for Rand to fall asleep, basically, so that way she can enter. But um, there's just this great scene with her and Ishmael. And it's like a lover's quarrel, so to speak, or a lover's banter back and forth, even though they're, they're not really lovers per se. And it's amusing, though, and it's really... Well done. And I love her character too. She's just so, so evil. And so charismatic. And I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> but it's just really um, an attractive trait in my opinion for some reason. So there is that. And um, there is... There's really no focus on... Uh, Min or um, Matt in this episode at all. But we get Rand and Moraine and they are on the run from Lanfear initially. And Moraine, they come across the stable with his, where there's um, four horses and uh, a stable keep. And they tells the stable keep that she's going with them. Moraine kills the one horse and they take it off because that way there's no there's there's no real quick way for Lanfear to follow them. They could get a jump on her basically. Um, and oh, some people seem to have a problem with how Moraine handle that in terms of basically killing this horse to prevent from being used by land for your end. I, from knowing Maureen's character from the books, I, I think it's something that she would do given the necessity of the escape itself. She would do whatever needed to be done to save Rand. And to get the hell out of there. So that's what ends up happening. And um, the woman stays behind as a decoy while, while Rand and Maureen take off on foot at one point. And um, Lanfear does get her hands on a horse in a rather uh, seductive way yet very land for your way 
um, <laughs> showing me that she's just, you know, a woman that needs a horse and just happens to very easily deal with the man who's riding a horse. And next thing you know, she has her own horse, which is fine. <laughs> she's land free or she can do as she pleases. So she gives chase to Rand and Moraine, who end up uh, taking refuge with House Domadred, uh, Moraine's noble house. And Moraine's sister is a lot more welcoming this time of Moraine. And Moraine's nephew is there, and there's a little exchange that's very sweet with them all. But, um, this scene is very crucial. This is sequence, I should say, not scene. Um, as uh, Moraine and Rand, after they've gotten sufficiently cleaned up and looking a lot more presentable, uh, they're, they're tired, but Moraine knows that she can't go to sleep. Uh, if she does, Lanfear can enter into her dreams and potentially deal with her. And there is a choice given to Rand by Maureen to go to sleep and face Lanfear or just try and stay awake. And she doesn't tell him he has to. And because of that, I think that's why he ultimately decides to. That, and he knows that what Moraine is saying is true. That Lanfear loved the dragon in his past life. Therefore, he may have some sway over her in this life as well. And there may actually be some kind of deeper connection there that he can use to his um, benefit. Um, so he goes to sleep while Maureen watches over him and as soon as he's in the dream world he is fastened to this wheel in the middle of what looks like the ideal wasteland and Lanfear is standing across from him looking amazing I'm gonna, <laughs> evil as all evil and just um there's a little dialogue that takes place there, but it's more so just sort of showing the amount of control she has over dreams and over the dream world and over Rand specifically having been involved with him as Celine for quite a while we can assume. We don't really know how long, but uh, she does make a comment um, at one point to um, the woman who stayed behind with the horses that she has to remember that, that Rand is still young. Um, so even though she looks young, she's not. And she is one of the forsaken and... She is sworn to the Dark One, but she's not as sworn as Ishmael, who has basically pledged himself, heart and soul, to the Dark One, which he fully believes is, is right. Um, whereas everyone else seems to have their own agenda, from Leandrin to Lanfear, um, to even uh, <laughs> Varen Sedai. I almost forgot about that part. Varen Sedai is an interesting character in the books, and I love Varen and just how she's played excellently in this in this iteration. Uh, Varen is a historian. She is obsessed 
with chronicling history. And because of that, she's, uh, I don't want to give away too much for people who have not read the books, but at the same time, I will just say that she's not all that she appears either. There's an interesting exchange between her and um, uh, Landrin once Landrin returns to the Light Tower after delivering Nynaeve, Egwene, and Elaine to the Shanshang. And this exchange is just a really, it's very casual, predictable, you could tell, exchange between the two. Yet, it's so just two people appeasing each other because they can't. But the exchange is just so amusing to watch. And I just, I love th just the sarcasm of Leandrin and the innocence that she tries to portray. Yet, it's just so evil and so attractive. <laughs> I don't really know how else to, 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 to define it. I like it so much, and I love the actress that plays Leander, and she nails Leander, in my opinion. There you have some of the key points from The Wheel of Time, Episode 5, Season 2. I will be back next week with Season 2, Episode 6 review, slash overview. Get, leave your thoughts in the comment section below or feel free to message me via the Facebook link found in the description. You can also contact me via the email address in my about section on my page as well. You can contact me any way you desire. I'd love to hear from you and hear your thoughts. This is Rob with Media Awareness. I will see you all again soon. Have a wonderful morning, noon, or night, wherever you are. Take care. Bye.